Hi, welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Mike Parker, and since 2008, it's been my privilege to be the instructor for this class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures, teachings, and history of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Time and location are available on the class website. There's a link to that in the show notes just below this video. Also on the class website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for the content on these sites. What you're about to see is a recording of my notes for one of the lessons. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and the authority and keys that he held are now vested in the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And most importantly, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. I hope you enjoy this lesson. In this lesson, we'll be discussing Emma Hale Smith, the elect lady. We'll also review revelations to Joseph Smith about the administration of the sacrament and authority in the Church of Christ. We'll be covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 25, 27, and 28. The three revelations in this lesson were received in the summer of 1830. After the first conference of the church in Fayette, New York, on the 9th of June, 1830, Joseph returned home to his wife, Emma, in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Joseph and Emma were desperately poor during these years. Two years earlier, Joseph had contracted with Emma's father, Isaac Hale, to buy a 13-acre farm. He still had not paid the $200 he owed his father-in-law for the property. As we discussed in the last lesson, the church had begun experiencing increasing persecution in Colesville, New York. It was during this challenging time that Joseph began his translation of the Bible, starting with the vision in Moses chapter one. He also received four revelations, now canonized as sections 24, 25, 26, and 27 in the Doctrine and Covenants. Section 25, the Elect Lady Revelation, was a revelation to Emma Smith. This presents us with the opportunity to tell Emma's story. Emma Hale was born on the 10th of July, 1804, in Harmony, Pennsylvania, to Isaac Hale and Elizabeth Lewis Hale. She was the seventh of nine children. She was five feet, nine inches, or 1.75 meters tall. She had dark hair, dark eyes, and a quick wit. As a young woman, she could manage a canoe and was a skilled horseback rider. She sang in her church choir. She also was exceptionally bright and received a secondary education at a girls' school. She met Joseph Smith Jr. in October, 1825. Joseph occasionally boarded at the Hale home in Harmony while Josiah Stoll employed him to look for a Spanish silver mine. Isaac Hale did not approve of Joseph. He considered him to be, quote, a careless young man and not very well educated, unquote. And he wrote that Joseph's treasure seeking profession was, quote, a business that I could not approve of, unquote. After courting Emma for over a year, Joseph asked her father for her hand in marriage. Isaac Hale turned him down. Joseph and Emma eloped to South Bainbridge, New York, where they were married on the 18th of January, 1827. He was 21 years old. She was 22. 
Emma later recalled, quote, I had no intention of marrying when I left home, but preferring to marry him to any other man I knew, I consented, unquote. The newly married couple initially lived with Joseph's parents in Manchester, New York. Emma played a significant role in Joseph's early translations and revelations. She drove the wagon and waited at the bottom of the hill on the night of the 21st of September, 1827, when Joseph retrieved the gold plates that contained the Book of Mormon. For a time, she served as Joseph's scribe as he translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. She also served as Joseph's scribe for a portion of his translation of the Bible. She was a strong-willed woman who stood up for what she believed was right. She was not afraid to tell Joseph when he was wrong. Here's one example of her character, drawn from a biography of Emma. Quote, In April 1844, after a five-day visit to St. Louis, Emma returned to Nauvoo to find that a bar, complete with counter, shelves, and glasses for serving liquor, had been set up in the front room of the mansion house, the Smith family residence that also served as a hotel. Emma confronted her husband. Joseph, what is the meaning of that bar in this house? Joseph explained that a new building across the street was planned for Porter Rockwell's bar and barber shop, but until it could be completed, Porter had set up the bar in the mansion house. Emma asked him, how does it look for the spiritual head of a religious body to be keeping a hotel in which a room is fitted out as a liquor selling establishment. Joseph countered that all hotels have bars and the arrangement was only temporary. Emma replied, I will take my children and go across to the old house and stay there, for I will not have them raised up under such conditions as this arrangement imposes upon us, nor have them mingle with the kind of men who frequent such a place. You are at liberty to make your choice. Either that bar goes out of the house or we will. Joseph answered, very well, Emma, I will have it removed at once. Soon, a frame structure designed to house Porter Rockwell's bar and barbershop began to rise across the street." Unquote. In March, 1842, Emma was sustained as president of the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo, she saw that organization grow from a charter membership of 20 women to more than 1,100 members at the end of its first year. After Joseph's death, most Latter-day Saints chose to follow Brigham Young to the West, but Emma decided to remain in Nauvoo. The reasons for her decision were complex, but five major concerns stand out. Joseph had been trustee in trust for the church and his personal assets were hopelessly commingled with the church's assets. Emma had personal conflicts with Brigham Young as she tried to secure as much of the church's assets as she could to support her family. She supported William Marks, the president of the Nauvoo stake, to replace Joseph Smith as the leader of the church. She was hostile to plural marriage and strongly opposed to its continued practice. She had tolerated polygamy for a time while Joseph was alive, but she did not want to see it continue as a church doctrine or practice. She felt an obligation to care for the prophet's elderly mother, Lucy Mack Smith. And she had moved her family three times in the last 15 years under the most difficult circumstances, and she was unwilling to move again. In November, 1844, five months after Joseph's death, Emma gave birth to their last child, a boy whom she named David Hiram. Except for a few months in 1846 that she spent in Iowa, she lived the remainder of her life in Nauvoo, where she raised her five living children. In December 1847, she married C. Lewis Bideman, a non-Mormon who was largely irreligious. She stayed married to him for the remaining 31 years of her life, despite his frequent infidelity. Emma also cared for Lucy Mack Smith until Mother Smith's death in 1856. Lucy was unable to lift or bend her arms in the last year of her life, and Emma fed Lucy all her meals. In 1868, at age 64, Emma took into her home four-year-old Charles Biderman, the son of an adulterous relationship her husband Lewis had with Nancy Abercrombie. 
In his later years, Charles recalled, quote, I was raised in her home and knew what kind of a woman she was. I never heard her say an unkind word or raise her voice in anger or contention. She had a queenly bearing without the arrogance of a queen, a noble woman living and showing charity for all, loving and beloved." Unquote. In her later years, Emma bore frequent testimony of Joseph Smith's prophetic calling, including some of the most forceful testimony of the reality of the gold plates, the authenticity of the Book of Mormon, and Joseph's God-given gift to translate. Emma passed away on the 30th of April, 1879, at age 74. Her last words were, Joseph, yes, yes, I'm coming. Joseph's feelings for Emma were deep and plentiful. Reflecting on his reunion with her after an absence of several days in the summer of 1842, Joseph wrote, quote, with what unspeakable delight and what transports of joy swelled my bosom when I took by the hand on that night my beloved Emma, she that was my wife, even the wife of my youth, and the choice of my heart. Many were the reverberations of my mind when I contemplated for a moment the many scenes we had been called to pass through, the fatigues and the toils, the sorrows and sufferings, and the joys and consolations from time to time had strewn our paths and crowned our board. Oh, what a commingling of thought filled my mind for the moment. Again, she is here, even in the seventh trouble, undaunted, firm and unwavering, unchangeable, affectionate Emma." Unquote. Despite the disagreements they had concerning plural marriage, he loved her deeply and she loved him with her whole soul. Emma and Joseph had nine children together and adopted two more. Four of their children died at childbirth, two died in infancy, and another died a young man. Only four of their children, three of their own and one adopted, survived to old age. Their first child, a boy they named Alvin, died on the same day he was born from undescribed birth defects at Harmony, Pennsylvania on the 15th of June, 1828. Their next two children, twin brother and sister Thaddeus and Louisa, were born in Kirtland, Ohio on the 30th of April, 1831. The babies were born prematurely and lived only three hours. The next day, a member of the church named Julia Murdoch died after giving birth to twins. Their father, John Murdoch, having three other children to raise alone, gave his newborn twins to Joseph and Emma. They named the twins Julia Murdoch Smith and Joseph Murdoch Smith in recognition of their birth parents. Joseph Murdoch Smith died from measles at 11 months of age, but Julia Murdoch Smith lived to adulthood. Julia was a sensitive girl with a streak of daring and a sense of humor that endeared her to her father, Joseph Jr. She was 13 years old when Joseph was killed. She married at age 18, but was widowed after only four years. She soon remarried, but her second husband was an abusive alcoholic. She endured with him for over 20 years and finally left him and returned to live with Emma in 1877. She died the 12th of September, 1880 at Nauvoo at age 49, probably from some type of cancer. She survived Emma by only 16 months. She had no children. Joseph Smith III, known as Young Joseph, was born the 6th of November, 1832 in Kirtland. He was Emma's fourth natural born child and the first to survive past infancy. He was just six years old when his father was arrested in Missouri and taken to Liberty Jail. Young Joseph tried to hold on to his father's leg, but the guard thrust him away with the broad side of his sword. He was 11 when his father died. As an adult, he studied and practiced law. In 1860, at age 27, 
he accepted the position of prophet president of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He led the RLDS Church for 64 years until his death in December 1914 at age 82. He was married three times and was twice a widower. He had 17 children, three of whom served in his stead as president of the RLDS Church. Frederick Granger William Smith was born in Kirtland the 20th of June, 1836. He was eight years old when his father Joseph was killed. Frederick suffered from poor health. He died an early death in 1862, age 25, possibly from tuberculosis. Little is known about him personally, other than what was described as his sweet nature and his disinterest in participating in any conflicts over religion. He was married and had one daughter. Alexander Hale Smith was born 2nd of June, 1838 at Far West, Missouri. He was not terribly religious until the death of his brother Frederick in 1862. After that, he joined the reorganized church and served a mission to Utah, where he tried, unsuccessfully, to convert his cousins in Hiram Smith's family to the reorganization. He served as a counselor to his brother, Joseph III, in the presidency of the RLDS Church. He later served as the church's presiding patriarch. He was married and had eight children. Don Carlos Smith was born in Nauvoo, Illinois on the 13th of June, 1840. He was the namesake of Joseph Jr.'s youngest brother. He died aged 14 months from malarial fever, only eight days after the same illness took the life of his uncle after whom he was named. In February 1842, Emma gave birth to a stillborn son, whom they may have named Thomas. Joseph and Emma's ninth and last child was David Hiram, born 17th November 1844, five months after his father's death. He was a poet, a singer, and an artist. David served as a missionary for the RLDS Church and as a counselor to his older brother, Joseph III, in the RLDS First Presidency. In his early 20s, he tragically began to show symptoms of mental illness. By 1877, his condition had deteriorated to the point that his family was forced to commit him to the Illinois Hospital for the Insane. He died there in 1904 at age 59. A few weeks before her death, on the 30th of April, 1879, Emma dreamed that the prophet Joseph came and took her to a beautiful mansion. In one of the rooms was a baby, whom Emma recognized as her child, Don Carlos. She dreamed she caught the child up in her arms and wept. When she regained her composure, she asked Joseph where the rest of the children were. He assured her that if she would be patient, she would have them all. The revelation in section 25 was received in early July 1830. It was directed specifically to Emma Smith, whom the Lord addressed as my daughter. DNC 25 verses 1 through 3, quote, Hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, while I speak unto you, Emma Smith, my daughter. For verily I say unto you, all those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. A revelation I give unto you concerning my will, and if thou art faithful and walk in the paths of virtue before me, I will preserve thy life, and thou shalt receive an inheritance in Zion. Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady whom I have called." Unquote. The title elect lady is drawn from the second epistle of John in the New Testament. Elect means chosen. Just as citizens vote to elect certain individuals to serve the people in earthly governments, God elects or chooses certain individuals to serve him and to do his work on the earth. Emma Smith was one who was called and chosen by God. Emma was far, far more than just an ordinary woman trying to scratch out a meager existence on the American frontier. She was an elect lady. 
The Lord sees in us what we often fail to see in ourselves because of our limited perspectives. DNC 25 verses 5 through 7. Quote, and the office of thy calling shall be for a comfort unto my servant, Joseph Smith, Jr., thy husband, in his afflictions, with consoling words, in the spirit of meekness. And thou shalt go with him at the time of his going, and be unto him for a scribe, while there is no one to be a scribe for him, that I may send my servant, Oliver Cowdery, whithersoever I will. And thou shalt be ordained under his hand to expound scriptures, and to exhort the church according as it shall be given thee by my spirit." Unquote. Emma's calling was to be a comfort to her husband, to be a scribe for him when Oliver Cowdery wasn't available to serve in that role, and to expound scriptures and to exhort the church. In a previous lesson, we discussed how Emma served for a time as Joseph's scribe during the translation of the Book of Mormon. After she received the section 25 revelation, she wrote a portion of the manuscript for Joseph's new translation of the Bible. At the 17th of March, 1842 meeting at which the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo was organized, Joseph Smith stated that Emma, quote, was ordained at the time the revelation, that is section 25, was given to expound the scriptures to all and to teach the female part of the community and that she, not she alone, but others may attain to the same blessings." Unquote. He further explained that the July 1830 revelation, quote, was then fulfilled by Sister Emma's election to the presidency of the Relief Society, she having previously been ordained to expound the scriptures, Unquote. As Joseph declared in 1842, women in the church today may attain to the same blessings that were promised to Emma by being called to lead and teach. DNC 25 verses 11 through 12, quote, and it shall be given thee also to make a selection of sacred hymns as it shall be given thee, which is pleasing unto me to be had in my church. For my soul delighteth in the song of the heart. Yea, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me and it shall be answered with a blessing upon their heads, unquote. In this revelation, the Lord instructed Emma to compile the church's first hymn book. Aided by William W. Phelps, she made a collection of hymns that were going to be printed in Missouri in 1833, but mobs destroyed the church's press. Emma revised the collection of hymns, and the hymn book was printed in February 1836 in Kirtland, Ohio. It included 90 hymns, 34 of which had been written by members of the church. A second edition was printed in 1841 in Nauvoo, Illinois. It contained 340 hymns. A third edition was planned, but it was never printed. In August or September 1830, Joseph Smith received a revelation at Harmony, Pennsylvania that is now canonized as section 27 in the Doctrine and Covenants. Joseph explained the background of this revelation. Quote, Early in the month of August, 1830, Newell Knight and his wife paid us a visit at my place in Harmony, Pennsylvania, and as neither his wife nor mine had been as yet confirmed, it was proposed that we should confirm them and partake together of the sacrament before he and his wife should leave us. In order to prepare for this, I set out to go to, to procure some wine for the occasion, but had gone only a short distance when I was met by a heavenly messenger and received the following revelation, the first paragraph of which was written at this time and the remainder in the September following." Unquote. The text of the earliest manuscripts and printings of the Revelation, including the version in the 1833 Book of Commandments, are considerably shorter than the expanded version that first appeared in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. The early versions of the Revelation only included what is now DNC 27 verses 1 through 5a, 14 through 15a, and a single phrase from verse 18, a total of 193 words. The 1835 version, which is nearly identical to our current version, is 654 words, 
over three and one third times the length of the original version. Although it's possible that the additional material that appeared in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants was the remainder of the revelation Joseph received in September 1830, it's more likely that Joseph expanded on the earlier revelation in 1835. DNC 27, verses 2 through 5a, quote, For, behold, I say unto you, that it mattereth not what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, when ye partake of the sacrament, if it so be that ye do it with an eye single to my glory, remembering unto the Father my body, which was laid down for you, and my blood, which was shed for the remission of your sins. Wherefore, a commandment I give unto you, that you shall not purchase wine, neither strong drink of your enemies, Wherefore, you shall partake of none, except it is made new among you. Yea, in this my Father's kingdom, which shall be built up on the earth. Behold, this is wisdom in me. Wherefore, marvel not, for the hour cometh that I will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth. Unquote. The emblems used in administering the sacrament of the Lord's Supper are symbolic of the body and blood of Christ. Any food or drink may, with permission of priesthood leaders, be used as the emblems by which we remember Jesus' atonement. Some Christian denominations believe that the sacramental bread and wine literally become the body and blood of Christ, which the believers then eat and drink. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does not accept this doctrine. The bread and water, having been blessed, are still just bread and water, only they have been consecrated and set apart for a holy purpose. This command directed members of the church to produce their own wine for use in the sacrament. This verse should not be interpreted as a commandment to only use unfermented wine, that is to say grape juice. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints used fermented wine in the sacrament throughout the 19th century. In fact, one of the missions of the settlers in Utah's Dixie region was to produce wine for the church to use in sacrament meetings. Tokerville and Santa Clara were the chief centers of its production. At its height, this region produced 3,000 gallons, or 11,350 liters, per year. There was constant temptation, however, to consume the product locally. The church didn't formally switch from using wine to using water in the sacrament until after the turn of the 20th century. The First Presidency and the Twelve first substituted water for wine in the sacrament in their temple meetings starting in July 1906. President Joseph F. Smith's support for national alcohol prohibition was the motivation for the change, and DNC 27 verse 2 was the scriptural justification for it. The promise from the Lord that, quote, the hour cometh that I will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth, Unquote, repeats the one he gave his apostles at the Last Supper after he blessed wine and offered to them that he would, quote, not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom, unquote. Elder John Taylor, then a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught in an address in the Salt Lake Tabernacle, quote, we have met to partake of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and we should endeavor to draw away our feelings and affections from things of time and sense. For in partaking of the sacrament, we not only commemorate the death and sufferings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but we also shadow forth the time when he will come again and when we shall meet and eat bread with him in the kingdom of God. When we are thus assembled together, we may expect to receive guidance and blessings from God, from whom, the scriptures inform us, every good and perfect gift proceeds." Unquote. The lengthy passage from the second half of verse 5 through verse 13, probably added by Joseph Smith in 1835, recalls or prophesies of 13 major historic of individuals who hold priesthood keys that had been or would be bestowed upon Joseph Smith as part of the restoration of the gospel. To Moroni, the Lord had committed the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim, meaning the Book of Mormon. To Elias, the Lord had committed the keys of bringing to pass the restoration of all things spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets 
since the world began. The Lord sent John to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery to ordain you unto the first priesthood which you have received, that you might be called and ordained even as Aaron. To Elijah, the Lord committed the keys of the power of turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, that the whole earth may not be smitten with a curse. It is through the prophets Joseph, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham that the promises remain. Although we have no record of any of them visiting Joseph Smith or bestowing specific keys upon them, the promises they received are part of the new and everlasting covenant of marriage and are invoked and bestowed in the sealing ordinance in the temple. Michael, or Adam, is the father of all, the prince of all, the ancient of days. Joseph Smith taught that Adam holds all the keys of the priesthood for this earth, and that one day Adam will return these keys to Jesus Christ in preparation for the Lord's second coming. The New Testament apostles, Peter, James, and John, were sent by the Lord and ordained and confirmed you to be apostles and as special witnesses of my name and bear the keys of your ministry and of the things which I, the Lord, revealed unto them. They bestowed the Melchizedek priesthood on Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. Section 28 was received in September 1830 after two challenges arose to Joseph Smith's authority as head of the church. In late July 1830, Oliver Cowdery sent a letter from Fayette, New York, to Joseph, who was in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Oliver had found what he believed was an error in the Articles and Covenants of the Church. It required that candidates for baptism, quote, truly manifest by their works that they have received of the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of their sins, unquote. As no such requirement was found in the Book of Mormon, Oliver wrote to Joseph, quote, I command you in the name of God to erase those words that no priestcraft be amongst us." Unquote. Joseph replied with a letter demanding of Oliver, quote, by what authority he took upon him to command me to alter or erase, to add or diminish to or from a revelation or commandment from Almighty God. Unquote. Joseph himself then traveled to Fayette, where he labored with great difficulty to convince Oliver and the Whitmer family, quote, to acknowledge that they had been in error and that the sentence in dispute was in accordance with the rest of the commandment. One month later, persecution and mob violence in the Harmony area began increasing. Even Emma's father, Isaac Hale, turned against Joseph. He told the prophet that he would no longer offer him the protection of his home. Peter Whitmer Sr. invited the Smiths to return to his home in Fayette and live there. When Joseph arrived in Fayette, he discovered that Hiram Page, one of the eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon, had been using a seer stone to receive revelations concerning Zion, church organization, and other doctrines. Many church members in Fayette, including the Whitmers and Oliver Cowdery, had been deceived by these revelations and accepted them as the word of God to the church. At this point, the Lord had not yet given instructions concerning who could receive revelations for the church, so it was perhaps understandable that someone as prominent as one of the eight witnesses could claim such power and authority. At first, Joseph was going to wait until the next conference of the church, scheduled for 26 September 1830, to address the problem. But when he realized how widespread the error was within the church, he confronted Oliver and the Whitmers. He also asked the Lord for direction. In response, Joseph received a revelation that he directed to Oliver. Joseph later wrote that, at the 26th September conference, quote, Brother Page, as well as the whole church who were present, renounced the said stone and all things connected therewith, much to our mutual satisfaction and happiness. Unquote. DNC 28, verses 1 and 2, 6 and 7, 11 through 13. Quote, Behold, I say unto thee, Oliver, that it shall be given unto thee that thou shalt be heard by the church in all things whatsoever thou shalt teach them by the Comforter concerning the revelations and commandments which I have given. But behold, verily, verily, I say unto thee, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church, excepting my servant, Joseph Smith, Jr., for he receiveth them even as Moses. 
and thou shalt not command him who is at thy head, and at the head of the church. For I have given him the keys of the mysteries, and the revelations which are sealed, until I shall appoint unto them another in his stead. And again, thou shalt take thy brother, Hiram Page, between him and thee alone, and tell him that those things which he hath written from that stone are not of me, and that Satan deceiveth him. For behold, these things have not been appointed unto him. Neither shall anything be appointed unto any of this church, contrary to the church covenants. For all things must be done in order, and by common consent in the church, by the prayer of faith. Unquote. In many Protestant churches, including ones to which many of the early saints formerly belonged, decisions are made from the bottom up. If a matter is to be decided, the church's general leadership will call a convention, local churches will appoint and send representatives, and the delegates will debate over proposed solutions. Once a motion has been made and voted on, it becomes the binding law of that denomination. The Church of Jesus Christ, on the other hand, works from the top down. The Lord reveals his will to the president of the church, and the matter is then presented to the leading quorums of the church or its members for their sustaining vote. As we discussed in the last lesson, common consent is not a democracy. We do not vote on motions made by church leaders. Rather, common consent is a control mechanism that prevents leaders from overstepping their authority or making decisions in the absence of all the information they should have. DNC 28 verses four and five, quote, And if thou art led at any time by the comforter to speak or teach, or at all times by the way of commandment unto the church, thou mayest do it, but thou shalt not write by way of commandment, but by wisdom, unquote. This revelation affirms that all members of the church are to be prophets and revelators. However, these gifts are restricted to their own sphere of stewardship. Bishops may receive revelation for their wards, but not for the entire stake. Relief society presidents may receive revelation for the women in their organizations, but not for priesthood quorums. Fathers and mothers may receive revelation for their families, but not their neighbors' families. Each of us may receive revelation for ourselves, but not for our ward, for our stake, or for the entire church. Elder Charles C. Rich of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, quote, it is important that when we need revelations, that we understand what channel they should come through. The Lord told Oliver Cowdery that Joseph was the man to receive revelations for the church. Oliver might receive revelations for himself, but those to the church must come through Joseph Smith or the leader. If we need revelations for our guidance, what channel should they come through? The Lord will speak to us through the head of the church, through him who holds the presidency. We should all understand these principles that we may not be deceived. And if revelations are given from any other source professing to guide the church, we may know they are not from God. All of us have the privilege of receiving revelations. For the church, by no means. We cannot receive all that are necessary for the performance of our duties. We have here a stake of Zion and a presidency of this stake. Can anyone receive revelations for the government of this stake? Certainly not. If any person other than the presidency should profess to receive revelations for its government, would you consider them genuine revelations? If so, would, you would be mistaken. We are entitled to the Holy Spirit to help us in the discharge of our duties and to teach us all that is necessary for our guidance. The bishop is entitled to the spirit of revelation to teach him his duties. And when guided by that spirit, he will never come in collision with those who preside over him." Unquote. The key point here is that revelations given to the church as a whole will always come to the head of the church and never to anyone else. From the time of Hiram Page down to today, there have been countless individuals who have claimed that the church has been led astray or has fallen and asserted that God has called them to correct or to lead the church. They have drawn after them not only the unstable, but also the very elect. It is our duty to follow the Lord's chosen servants and not be led astray by those who think their mission is to set the church in order. If our leaders truly are in error, they can be properly corrected or removed by priesthood quorums acting in unity or by the saints via common consent.
In October 1865, the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles issued a proclamation that contained the following important instruction and a stern warning. Quote, it ought to have been known years ago by every person in the church, for ample teachings have been given on this point, that no member of the church has the right to publish any doctrines as the doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints without first submitting them for examination and approval to the First Presidency and the Twelve. There is but one man upon the earth at one time who holds the keys to receive commandments and revelations for the church, and who has the authority to write doctrines by way of commandment unto the church. And any man who so far forgets the order instituted by the Lord as to write and publish what may be termed new doctrines, without consulting with the first presidency of the church respecting them, places himself in a false position, and exposes himself to the power of darkness by violating his priesthood. While upon this subject, we wish to warn all the elders of the church, and, and to have it clearly understood by the members, that in the future, whoever publishes any new doctrines without first taking this course, will be liable to lose his priesthood." Unquote. There's one final thing I'd like to mention from section 28. This revelation included instructions to Oliver Cowdery to depart following the September 1830 conference to preach unto the Lamanites, and that the city of Zion would be built on the borders near the Lamanites where he would preach. Our next two lessons will focus on these two developments, the Lamanite mission and revelations that revealed the location of the city of Zion and commanded the saints to gather there. That concludes this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes and this slideshow. In our next lesson, we'll discuss the earliest missionary efforts of the restored church. The reading is sections 29 through 34. See you next week.